We all have our own ideas about um, what we would do to fix the world. Whether it be down the, the pub with a pal or over a coffee in, uh, and cakes as the kids play or even just you know your own musings in the shower. We all put the world to rights, don't we, sometimes? We think, you know, I, if I was the Prime Minister, I would do what? What would you do? What would you do? Well, I'd make sure that those rascals who had that party, I'd make sure they were found out and that they'd be made to pay as a warning to others, bring shame upon them. Or maybe be, well, I wouldn't be afraid of this COVID thing. I just get rid of all these measures and I'd, let's get natural immunity. Or maybe you'd be like, no, let's shut everything down. We're not doing enough. We must protect people from themselves. They don't know what's good for them. We need to take away their freedom for their own goods. Climate change, uh, the Formula One results, uh, vaccine passports. We all know, we all have an idea about what we do to make things right and just, don't we? But why do we do that? Why do we have those conversations? Why do we think that way? Well, maybe we think and talk about all that stuff because actually it's easier to imagine how to fix all that stuff out there than it is to think about how we'll fix all this stuff in here. The media has a lot to answer for. Uh, they're always spinning a narrative. They're always telling us what we should care about, directing the nation's attention to what suits them. I mean, if you just pull up the, the BBC News uh, page just now, you'd be forgiven for thinking you stumbled onto the NHS website. Um, there's loads of information about how to diagnose a cold and how to live your life and what you should do and what family you should see. But when I looked it up, not one mention on the front page of um, Ghislaine Maxwell's case, not one mention on there of this woman who was on trial for helping Epstein find children for the rich and famous. I wonder why? No, they don't show that because they want to show what will get more views. It's, um, you've probably seen you know, at the moment, there's just lots of kind of these magazine panel style TV shows where TV personalities, uh, they sit there and talk and put the world to rights, spouting their own misinformed ideas. Um, further dividing people and giving voice to the most ignorant ideas out there and we love to watch them that's the thing we can blame the media but the reason they put that stuff on is because we love we love it we want to watch it they are only giving us what we crave we want to be distracted we want to either argue with the tv and feel you know, vindicated because i'm right and they're stupid or we want to watch and hear what everyone's saying that agrees with us and feel validated because it's far easier to judge and put right these abstract problems that are actually really far removed from us than dealing with the storm of emotions raging in our own hearts and minds. Because the reality is, even if you were given power for the day and you got to do all the things you said you'd do over that pint in the pub, you know, getting to the bottom of the party business, you know, um, making people, make sure there's justice and people pay, getting the COVID measures you think should be in place, in place. Do you know what? It wouldn't make one bit of difference to your actual life. It wouldn't make one bit of difference to your actual life. It wouldn't solve any of your real problems. It wouldn't soothe your soul. It wouldn't mend your broken heart. Those things are not actually what we need. They are not the solutions we really want. We're being told that they are, but they don't address our real desires. What we really want is to be loved, to know that someone is on our side, no matter what we do, no matter how much we screw up. We want to belong. We just want to live without being judged and being made to feel bad. We want to live life free of abuse, we want to be free of our own insecurities. We want to be known. We want people to see us for who we really are, not just who they think we might be. We want to be known deeply and have real relationships with people. We want to understand ourselves. 
We want to live in a world where we know our place, where our life has meaning and it makes sense, where we're not just chasing a paycheck and a better car and a nicer house and a posher coffin. We want to understand the world and our place in it. We want our lives to have meaning. Surely those are actually some of our deepest desires. What can satisfy those desires? What can fix this world? Well, Doug, we need better leaders. We need better policies. We need more money. We need better research. Some people say we need less billionaires. We need to spread the wealth. And others are like, no, no, no. We need more capitalism to drive people to lift themselves up. Left, right, up, down. All these ideas about how the world can be fixed. But the problem with all of it is that we are always doing the choosing. And we always choose badly. Have you noticed? We always choose badly. And there's only ever really bad choices. Because there's a deeper problem with humanity, isn't there? There's a sickness in us. We experience it when other people treat us badly. We feel it. And we see it when we are, we see it in ourselves as well, don't we? When we catch ourselves saying hurtful things. We catch ourselves thinking hurtful things. Lying. Gossiping. And so when we, you know, as a nation, when we replace one leader with another, they are still going to have the same deep sickness. It might manifest itself in different ways, but it's going to come out. At its root, this sickness inside us is is pride and selfishness. and, And no human can rule without putting themselves first at least a little bit. Whether it be benefiting their friends or their family or getting themselves the best jobs or even lining their own pockets. And the thing is, right, each one of us, if we were put in that position, we would struggle not to have one rule for them and another rule for us. You see, I actually refuse to believe that public office only attracts the most broken and selfish people. I just believe it brings it out in all of us. You see, the thing is, we don't just need a different system. We don't just need a different person. We need a different type of person. We need a completely new kind of humanity, because this one's broken. We need a ruler, a king, who isn't sick who isn't taken down by our sickness, who doesn't have a selfish bone in his body, who will truly rule for the benefit of those in his care. And a ruler not only for this one nation, but who will rule all the nations of the world in this way. And we think, could there really be one? I mean, we can't unite this one nation. Could there really be somebody who could unite the whole world? Who could be the answer to every nation's problems? Would it be possible to find a king who could meet the needs of the whole world? The great news we receive in church is the answer is yes, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the desire of nations. That is one of the titles given to him, and it's given in Haggai chapter 2, verse 7, which we read this morning. It says, And I will shake all nations... So that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now, you may have noticed, hang on, Doug, it doesn't say the desire of nations there. What are you talking about? Well, I think this is one place where the ESV has made a poor translation choice. It's that sentence there, it's hidden in, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. That word treasures, now it could technically be translated treasure, that is an option, um, singular, but it's actually, even that's an outlier option. It makes much more sense that it's not treasure. But it should definitely not be treasures, because in the Hebrew it's not plural. It's a singular word. Now, I don't really understand why the ESV translators have made this decision. I can only assume that they've started with the presumption that this must be speaking about silver and gold only. And therefore, when you speak of many nations, 
Uh, we know that nations don't share treasure, one lump of treasure. So there must be many treasures and they've kind of overruled the Hebrew on that point. And sometimes, you know, that happens, whatever. But I think they've made a huge assumption of what the Old Testament's about uh, and what Israel's about, what the Temple's about when they've made that decision. Because given that quite clearly this is a singular word in, in the singular tense, and given that there are better words that can be translated for that word, it makes much more sense to go with the translation, the desire, singular, of all the nations, which all the translations do go with. And it makes much more sense, doesn't it? Haggai the prophet is writing about the glory returning to the people. And let's be clear, he's not, he's not ultimately talking about this model temple that stands in Jerusalem. He's talking about the real temple, the eternal temple, Christ, his body, the church. And so Haggai is speaking of a day when the glory of God will fill the temple perfectly. Do we think that Haggai is speaking of gold and silver then? No. We're told gold and silver will burn away. It is not eternal. What then is the glory of God? Well, as we always say, it's not what, but who is the glory of God? Jesus. Jesus is the glory of God. He is the one who will fill his temple, the church. He is the one who will come and shake the nations. He is the one that when the nations are, sh uh, are shaken, the desire of all nations will come in and fill the temple, fill the earth with his glory. He is the desire of all nations. But what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus is the one that all the nations of the earth have been waiting for. He is, the only, he is the one that they desire. He is the only one who will bring them peace and stability and unity and prosperity. And you might go, but Doug, they don't desire Jesus. They clearly don't want him. And you're right. This is the thing. He is the answer to all the world's desires, even if they don't want him. He is the answer to all the world's problems, even if they don't see it. He is everything they desire, even while they reject him. We might think, well, that's weird, isn't it? Well, it's not weird, because we're all a little bit like this. In fact, we're all a lot like this. We might want to you know, argue, well, if the nations wanted him, then they'd, they'd have him. But we know it doesn't work that way. We don't always pursue what we'd really want. We don't always pursue what we know is really good for us. Our desires are messed up and other motives get in the way. So just as much as I desire to be, you know, this fit Adonis and like, you know, perfect sculpted replica of perfect manliness, you d I desire that kind of, not really, but I kind of desire, but you don't see me in the gym every morning, do you? Because there's other desires that get in the way. Other motives that get in the way. As Christians, we say, you know, our desire is to walk with Jesus. To have a close walk with him. To obey him and to live lives, you know, enriched in prayer and the scriptures. Where we just kind of feel like we float through the world and nothing touches us. We're not anxious because we're so taken up with Jesus. And we could have that. But we don't pursue it, do we? Like... Just, just look at your day. How much time do you spend in prayer and the scriptures compared to scrolling on your phone and Netflix? Maybe we really, you know, we really desire for a relationship to be fixed. Like, oh, that's what we want. We just want a relationship with our, you know, either our spouse or a parent or a child. But we're not willing to humble ourselves and apologize. And so in the same way, the world leaders get in the way of the nation's desire because they don't really actually want what the nations desire as much as public servants go into office because they want to serve and help their motives are never pure and so they can never give the nations what they really want and need because there's a conflict with what they really want we get in the way because when, whenever we're given the opportunity to vote we don't vote for what's good for everyone we vote for what we think is going to be good for us. And people like us. 
Or we vote for what we think will be good for everyone else and how we think they should live. So, what hope is there? <coughs> if Jesus is the desire of nations, if Jesus is the only one who could fix all the world's problems and bring peace to our mind and our soul, but no one's ever going to vote for him, how do we get his help? Well, the good news is God doesn't operate in a democracy. For sure, he, he listens to us. He loves to listen to us. He hears all, all of our problems, but then, thank goodness, he gives us what's actually good for us and not necessarily what we've asked for, even if it's not what our flesh wants. And so Jesus isn't like sitting on the sidelines, you know, wearing a rosette, waiting to be voted in, hoping that people will notice that he is what they need. He's not a political leader. He's a king. He's king. He's born with the right to rule. He's the king. He's the king of kings. He's the king whether the people recognize it or not. You see, a king doesn't draw his power from the bottom up. He isn't you know, given power from the people. But he's a, one who, who's given power from the Lord, from God. He, power comes down to a king. God the Father, the one from whom all life and power flows, says, This is my blessed man. This is the one whom all my life is poured into. I give him all my authority to rule on my behalf. He is my Messiah. Now, we naturally might want to reject this idea of a king. Because um, the idea of monarchy is unpopular these days, isn't it? It's outdated, we might say. We may officially have a royal family in this country, and we may be called the United Kingdom. But if, uh, if our queen suddenly woke up one morning and started handing out blanket decrees, everyone would be quite upset, because functionally we live in a democracy, not a kingdom. The reason we reject the desire of nations is because we don't want a king. But the only reason we don't want a king is because we've never, ever had a good one. We've only experienced bad ones. The idea of completely giving control of our lives to another person should kind of rightly fill us with fear. Because no other person is good enough to do it well. Um, C.S. Lewis, he, he was, you know, many of us know him, he was a writer and a thinker and he wrote the, the Chronicle, of, he wrote the Narnia books. And he described why he believes in democracy. Listen. He says... A great deal of democratic enthusiasm descends from the ideas of people like Rousseau, who's a philosopher, who believed in democracy because they thought mankind was so wise and good that everyone deserved a share in the government. The danger of defending democracy on those grounds is that it's not true. I find that it's not true without looking any further than myself. I don't deserve a share in governing a hen roost, much less a nation. The real reason for democracy is mankind is so fallen that no man can be trusted with unchecked power over his fellows. Aristotle said that some people were only fit to be slaves. I do not contradict him, but reject slavery because I see no men fit to be masters. He's right, isn't he? He's right. But what if there was a king who is perfectly good? One who we could safely entrust all power and authority to. A king who truly made all his decisions based on what is good and best for others. Well, if that were possible, then no right-minded person would ever want democracy ever again. I mentioned this in passing on Thursdays we're at Bible study, but there's something truly freeing about being told what to do by somebody you love, by somebody who loves you, and by somebody you trust. You are freed then from having to work out what is good and bad for you. You are freed uh, from the burden of anguishing over a decision and worrying about making the wrong decision. You know that that person is not going to tell you to do anything that will harm you. And so you are free 
just to rest and to give your life to such a person. We see very small glimpses of that in, in our own lives, in church as you trust your pastors with teaching the Bible, in family life as we trust husbands and fathers, as we trust each other, as we come alongside each other, like when, when we're tired and we look to each other and go, help me just to know what to do here. But we experience it truly and fully and in a way we can't even begin to imagine when we begin to trust the Lord Jesus, the living God, with our lives. When we just receive his word and say, yes, Jesus, let it be as you have said. I will live the way you have said because I trust you and because you love me. And because I know that you just want the very best for me. So I don't have to second guess what you've said. As much as every now and again we read in the Bible, our flesh rises up like, I don't like that. But we get to go, I just trust you because you want all the best things for me. What we truly want, what the world desires is what we might call the benevolent dictator. A person who rules with absolute power, but rules absolutely for the good of the people, not at all for the good of themselves. And is this not who Jesus is? Is this not what we see so clearly, so very clearly, in the crucifixion? The cross is Jesus' throne. It is the place he receives his crown. It is the place where he received his kingdom and all the world was given over to him by his Father. How did he do it? By dying. By dying for you. Jesus left all the glory of heaven to come and die on the cross. What more does he need to do to show you that he loves you above himself and that he will do what is good for you and not necessarily what is good for him? And what's more, this benevolent dictator, this, this desire of nations is one of the people. You see, another reason we like democracy is because anyone, technically, can be prime minister or president, can't they? We get to put one of our people in charge. You know, a man of the people, someone who knows the plight of the everyday man on the streets. You don't often get that with kings, do you? Kings are born in a palace, they're brought up and they, they don't know anything about real life. But Jesus is a man of the people. He became one of us, not just any type of human. He didn't become a king, did he? He became a carpenter. He was a working class lad. He grew up in poverty. He knows what it is to be one of us. Jesus really is the whole package. He is the king that all the nations have been waiting for, as wise and as powerful as God, and as down to earth as man. In his birth, he showed us that he was born to be one of the people. In his death, he shows us that he will always put you first. We read in Haggai verse 5, Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations so that the desire of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Do you feel it? Do you feel it starting to shake? If nothing else, these past few years must teach us that this world is shaky. It is not solid. It will not last forever. It is not dependable. And this is good news. It's good news to know that about this world, about this world order. Because everything that can be shaken must be shaken down to make way for a new world order. The renewal of all things. The resurrection of the heavens and the earth to be the eternal dwelling place of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Even the nations will crumble away to make way for the desired of all nations. Nothing breaks our tight grip on this world so much as the realisation that it's all coming to an end. Not, not only in terms of our own death as we die and we let, have to let go of everything, leave everything behind, but in a much bigger way when as all the heavens and the earth are made new. We need to regularly meditate and think on that truth that all of this is temporary. When we do that, our perspective changes. The more we meditate on that great and terrible day. 
The nations are like the people were in Haggai 1, 5-6, so busy pursuing little things of this passing world. In truth, they resist Christ rather than desire him or love him. But in all their striving, they're actually thirsting for him and yet refusing to drink of him. It's mad, isn't it? We're thirsty for something and it's held out. No, I, I won't drink that. Thank you. Like the woman at the well in John 4, they are trying to quench their thirst with things that not just will not satisfy, but cannot satisfy. In all the hungering and thirsting, the grasping and conquering of the rise and fall of the nations, Jesus is the only one who can f- fulfill the desire of all the nations. He is the great logic of all maths and science, the fundamental axiom of all true philosophy. The word behind all language, the glory that gives beauty to all the worlds. The king who makes civilization possible. The true light that gives light to everyone. The chief musician who gives harmony to creation. He is the way, the truth and the life. And through him we can all come to the most holy father in the highest heaven. He is the answer. Not only to all the problems of the world and all the problems of the nations, but to every storm of your own life. Let me just finish with these words from Ignatius, the great father of the faith. He says, Let fire, cross, troops of wild beasts, dissections, rendings, scattering of bones, mincing of limbs, grinding of the whole body, ill tortures of the devil come upon me. Only may I gain Christ, only may I gain Jesus Christ. I seek him for who has died. I long for him who for us rose. Are you hungry for food? Long for Jesus. He is the bread and refreshment of angels. He is manna, containing in him all sweetness and pleasurable delight. Are you thirsty? Long for Jesus. He is the well of living water, refreshing so that you should never thirst again. Are you sick? Go to Jesus. He is the saviour, the physician, and salvation itself. Are you dying? Sigh for Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. Are you confused or perplexed? Come to Jesus. He is the angel of great counsel. Are you ignorant and lost? Ask Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Are you a sinner? Call on Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. To this end he came into the world. This is all his fruit to take away sin. Are you tempted by pride, gluttony, lust and laziness? Call on Jesus. He is humility, self-control, kindness, love and zeal. He bears our infirmities and carried, yes, and still does carry our griefs. Do you seek beauty? He is fairer than the children of men. Do you seek wealth? In him are all treasures. Yes, in him the fullness of the Godhead dwells. Are you ambitious for honour? Glory and riches are in his house. He is the king of glory. Are you looking for a friend? He has the greatest love for you. Who became, who because he loved you, came down from heaven, worked and endured the sweat, blood, cross and death. He prayed for you in the garden. Are you looking for wisdom? He is the eternal and uncreated wisdom of the Father. Do you need comfort and joy? Jesus is the sweetness of souls, the joy and jubilee of angels. Do you wish for righteousness and holiness? Jesus is the holy of holies. He is everlasting righteousness, justifying and sanctifying all who believe and hope in him. Do you wish for a blissful life? He is life eternal the bliss of the saints. Long then for Jesus, love him, sigh for him. In him you will find all good, outside of him all evil, all misery. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.